As a responsible person with growing concerns for your privacy and personal liberty, you want to know where we're headed and what you can do about it. We ask the experts what you need to do to take prudent and responsible action to safeguard your family's wealth and well-being and what basic first steps will help you to be aware and prepared. ReluctantPreppers.com Welcome back, Reluctant Preppers. We're privileged to have a favorite returning guest tonight, Rob Kirby, founder and host of KirbyAnalytics.com. He's a proprietary analyst in the precious metals arena. He's got a long history of experience with the precious metals industry, as well as uh, derivatives and other futures, uh, how it all affects the economy. And he has an uh, outspoken approach to commenting on the political scene and its interactions with the financial world. Rob, thank you so much for joining us once again on Reluctant Preppers. Pleasure to be with you again, Dunnigan. We had asked for viewer suggestions of questions to, to pose to you. Uh, you are uh, famously popular with our viewing community. They, they look forward to every time that you're able to appear with us. And there's always a, uh, a uh, you know, outpouring of interest and of, of ideas and questions and concerns that people have that they'd like to have you field. You can take these in any direction you like. I'll just, I'll have to choose a very few of these because there are so many, but I'd like to kick us one off uh, with that uh, involves uh, President Trump and potential financial collapse and what the possible relationship might be between those two. This comes from Bucklehead Creek 12. Basically it's a timeline question saying, if Trump is president, uh, will the powers that be not see another financial uh, opportunity for the next five to nine years to crash the system because Trump will not bail out the guys on the top. Outcome being the financial crash has been delayed at all costs. Your thoughts? Well, um, I would suggest to you the nature of the question that's been put forward uh, makes an assumption uh, or the, the, the provider of the question, I think, is operating under the assumption that Trump really is in charge. And my, my, my question back, or my sort of my working theory uh, as it's evolved, is I truly wonder if Donald Trump is fully up the curve in terms of how uh, integrated the U.S. Treasury is in global capital markets and, and, whether, and whether Trump necessarily is completely up the curve as to the extent of the operations of the Exchange Stabilization Fund. And I, wa I want to further that comment by saying I reach a point where I truly wonder and have wondered over the past number of months whether Donald Trump's selection of Mr. Mnuchin as his Treasury Secretary, whether it was really his choice. And in that, I'm going to, I wonder to myself anyway, whether, whether it's possible that Trump was possibly given a list of maybe two names and was told you will pick from one of these two. This way we can say it was your choice. Because my understanding of what the Exchange Stabilization Fund does in international markets, uh, in terms of the extent to which our capital markets uh, are rigged, the bond market is rigged, the precious metals arena is severely rigged, the foreign currency markets are highly, highly rigged. And the Exchange Stabilization Fund is the, is the dark force behind the rigging. And I believe that the Exchange Stabilization Fund is, a, is operated like a capital markets crack house. And I believe that this, that this entity needs to be outed for what it really is very publicly. And I believe that public pressure needs to be brought on the White House and specifically to Donald Trump's attention uh, in terms of just, just what this institution has been, been up to over the years, uh, uh, interfering in what I'm going to say years and years ago might have been much freer markets than they are today. 
So, and the perpetuation of, of this rigging in terms of uh, suppressing the price of precious metal, uh, rigging uh, interest rates at historic uh, low low rates, uh, this 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 in uh, like combined this amounts to I'm going to call it a system of dishonest commerce, dishonest money, and I guess at its core you can call it dishonest weights and measures. And you know we, there's a long history uh, of commentary on the concept of dishonest weights and measures. Um, uh, you know, the concept is written about in the Bible. Uh, the, the conceptually, uh, uh, d disgruntlement with dishonest weights and measures was the only time Jesus was ha said to have uh, become angry uh, with, with the money changers. And the dishonest weights, uh, or dishonest weights and measures or dishonest money, uh, it just seems to me, uh, it, it seems to be at the root of all the world's problems because dishonest money is no foundation upon which you would expect to build uh, peaceable international relations. And I mean, you know, all people need to do is take a look around them and look at the state of international affairs and look at the friction that exists currently in the world between the world's major players. This is, this is exactly what one would expect if one were to contemplate the world where you had dishonest money. And this is the world, this is exactly the world we're living in. So, you know, from that standpoint, I think it's I think it's a very very important topic and a very important concept to to propagate and and to uh, speak about publicly because I think if we could get around to uh, solving the the issue of dishonest uh, corrupt money uh, we might find that a lot of the friction and tension in the international uh, uh, relationships among countries around the world, uh, we might we might see those uh, resolve themselves to some degree, and and people might become a lot more peaceable uh, the world over, and you know and from that standpoint, it's my true belief now, and I, and I think that this needs to be said very forcibly, the the conduct of the exchange stabilization fund and its interference in the capital markets is akin to what we see uh, going on with the Roman Catholic Church and, 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 its, and its buggery with little boys. And the financial buggery that's being conducted by the Exchange Stabilization Fund uh, is causing damage all over the world just as uh, poor, poor and disgusting actions on players in the Roman Catholic Church have ruined many lives around the world. And, and, let's, and let's pay special note to the similarities between, between these two forms of corruption. The, the, the impropriety in the Catholic Church has been one of the one of the worst kept secrets for decades and decades. And it's it's been something that nobody in, in the public uh, domain would would uh, ever report. Uh, the media uh, buried the uh, admissions and the and the and the charges that have uh, flared up through the years. And this was this was something that was covered up at the highest levels of the of the Catholic Church. It was denied, and uh, uh, and and people people were people were were punished for for speaking out about it, and careers destroyed when people tried to speak out about it, and lo and behold, this is this is much the same way the the media 
and and the people in positions of power and the people actually uh, uh, involved in this heinous conduct uh, are the very people who covered it covered it up. But but what's occurring in our financial markets and what and what the exchange stabilization fund is doing to our capital markets is is tantamount to financial buggery, and it and it needs to be called what it is. And that's exactly what it is, and it needs to be outed. And and the people and the people who are responsible for keeping this in the dark, they they need to have their comeuppance too. Just just like we're starting to find people at the very highest levels of the Catholic Church are now being uh, called to answer for their for their conduct. Yeah, that's right. There's been there's been quite a vigorous uh, compared to a lot of other institutions. There's been quite a quite a uh, coming to uh, new policies, new approaches, and 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 seeking of what what was what were the uh, systemic uh, cover ups that were allowed to that perpetuate for so long in in the Catholic Church. But I don't we don't see that same or do we do you foresee that it's realistically possible we're going to see that same kind of a vigorous response. Uh, from corrupt financial, political, you know, arena. Well, well, done again. To me, uh, the, from where I sit and, and and the way I see things, the the interference and the suppression of the precious metals prices has become so severe and so in your face that I don't I don't see how it's going to be able to be kept under wraps. Indefinitely, uh, there, there's a huge problem that is developing uh, beneath the surface, and it's and it and it's been going on for a very long time. I will admit that, but there is the issue of demand for physical precious metal around the world, and I'm not talking about the demand for retail uh, uh, silver eagles or gold eagles or silver maples. I'm talking about sovereign demand around the world. Countries who have balance of trade surpluses, who are accumulating US dollars in their reserve accounts, who do not want to hold US dollars in greater amounts in their reserve accounts. They are buying gold, they are buying silver, and they are buying it hand over fist, and they are buying all they can get their hands on. And at some point, the the demand for physical metal, with with the amount of fiat money being supplied to the market continuing to rise at a geometric rate, the amount of people wishing to convert the fiat into physical metal will overwhelm this paper uh, price suppression mechanism, because to 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 justify or to continue uh, paper price suppression on futures markets and in unallocated uh, uh, paper markets like the LBMA in London, England, where, where, which is the biggest precious metals market in the world, uh, to make the uh, paper prices that are being exhibited on the screens in front of everyone's face, to make those prices uh, intelligible or believable, the, the powers that be do need to expend a certain amount of physical metal, because you know having a having a price of, of silver at at fourteen dollars or fifteen dollars, uh, when you can't buy an ounce of silver anywhere for under say twenty dollars, uh, uh, sort of dispels the notion that the uh, fourteen dollar price being exhibited in the paper market is any anything near real, and yet it's 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 the it's the uh, uh, it's it's the paper price of metal and 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 paper paper metal contracts are supplied uh, by uh, officialdom in infinite amounts, but the reality is the physical metal that comes out of the Earth's crust is very finite and it's very limited. And when you when you have when you have the price of something that is dear and finite and comes out of the earth's crust in, in very, very limited amounts, 
when you have the price of it being set by people who are supplying paper contracts in infinite amounts, uh, that, that's a dog that doesn't hunt, or at least not for too long. And, so, and somewhere along the line here, we're going to cross we're going to cross a threshold where the paper markets will be discredited. And when the paper markets are discredited, I'm going to suggest to people if they want to pay attention that the whole paper edifice, because much more than precious metals are traded in, uh, uh, let's say, paper form. Much, much of the energy complex is traded in paper form. Much of the uh, 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 bond market is traded in paper form. And the powers that be, by continuing this escapade of, su of price suppression, this financial buggery, as I call it, they, they'd better be somewhat mindful that if they discredit all paper markets, they could bring upon themselves a, a catastrophe and a cataclysmic event where people lose complete confidence in all of our crack house capital market uh, antics and activities. And this is something that I feel is brewing. And this is something that is not to be underestimated in, in terms of what kind of an effect it might have. We've got a couple of questions that are related to ones that you already touched on there. Um, they're talking about, uh, says Andy, uh, Ali Muhammad says, Andy McGuire said something recently about a large order of physical possibly defaulted on in the coming days, tomorrow, I believe. He was not clear about the details, but that was the impression. Any insight from Rob Kirby on that? I guess that gets back to your discussion about this increasing gap between the physical availability and demand versus the suppressed paper price. Uh, um, I, I will answer that by saying it's my understanding that Andrew McGuire is, is involved with the establishment of what's referred to as an allocated bullion exchange, where, where uh, basically it amounts to a cash and carry market for gold uh, uh, as, as set up in exchange in an exchange format, where if you, you know, to, to buy, to buy uh, or to sell, you, you will need to, on this exchange that he's involved with setting up, I, uh, my understanding is, if you're going to be a seller on that exchange, you will have to have physical bullion uh, to sell, not not uh, you know a contract that says you're you're good for it. You actually have to have the physical bullion in a vault, uh, and when someone buys it, they take direct ownership of that physical bullion. And uh, if if such an exchange were to have a successful launch, uh, where where an, un, an unusually large amount of physical bullion was demanded in a very short space of time. Um, it could it could actually uh, uh, possibly bust the uh, as we call it the cartel or their paper price suppression scheme um, by effectively demanding anybody who would be a seller to provide the physical. Uh, metal, and 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 what I what I believe Andrew is anticipating is that there will be a uh, a, a, a dissociation between the paper price and the physical price, where if if too much physical is demanded in a short period of time, uh, it won't be available at the at the rigged um, at, at the rigged uh, paper price, and we'll see a disparity. Uh, so, so for instance, if you have a truly physical exchange, um, and and the paper price is is you know held at a certain level, but to get, actually get physical, people have to pay uh, ever widening spreads over what the paper price is. It 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 would it would and could show that the paper price is 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 a fraud, and so Andrew, to a point, is speaking about the inevitability that I just spoke of, that at some point in time, the, the demand for physical metal will trump the infinite supply of paper metal by with people saying they don't want promises of gold, they want the real thing. So uh, his, and, and, in, and in his mind or in, in his view, 
I guess he feels that he's involved with a, a, a venture where a physical exchange will come into existence that will upset the apple cart, so to speak. Uh, I can't speak to the validity of anything he may or may not be involved in. And uh, all I can say is anything that would bring, uh, anything that would bring the, uh, uh, let's just say the, the spotlight onto the fraudulent nature of the, of the paper uh, suppression of uh, precious metals prices uh, would be a welcome thing. Uh, my my only point would just I uh, wouldn't necessarily bet on it happening today or tomorrow. In, in the next question has to do with that timeline. Um, uh, Slaromir Tomaszewski uh, point, points out uh, that this is maybe difficult, and because it's something that a lot of people who are been forecasting collapses have been directionally not yet proven right on For the last couple of years. Everybody talking about a market crash. The only guy who said the opposite, and he's right so far, is Martin Armstrong. He explains that capital flow is by far the most important factor. Anything else is, everything else is secondary, like any form of manipulation. I wonder what Rob's view is on this. Well, I mean, uh, I, I don't, uh, uh, frankly, I don't put a lot of stock in anything Martin Armstrong has to say, uh, pretty much, uh, at the best of times. Um, uh, Martin, Martin Armstrong, in my view, is a very conflicted, a very conflicted man, Martin Armstrong is a person who was very public uh, in the in, in the 2000 uh, time frame, year 2000 time frame, in speaking very clearly and very publicly that the precious metals markets were rigged, and he he was interviewed and had a lot of uh, a very uh, uh, close uh, discussion with uh, Chris Powell and Bill Murphy, where his views and his statements regarding rigging of the precious metals markets uh, were were expressed concisely and clearly and documented and time stamped, uh, and this uh, where where his where his relationship uh, uh, a very close relationship with one Edmund Safra, the owner of Republic Bank of New York, who was reputed to be in the '90s the world's biggest. Uh, 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 marketers or sellers of gold around the world and uh, it was it was none other than Martin Armstrong that that uh, revealed to Murphy and Powell uh, the GATA people in that time frame that uh, Edmund Safra had had relayed related to him that the gold market was rigged beyond belief uh, and it was it was Armstrong who who stated to uh, the GATA guys that uh, Safra had made tapes and and had flaming gun proof that the gold market was rigged. And you know, isn't it interesting that uh, you know? And and, and and interestingly enough, it was it was after it was after uh, uh, Armstrong had told U.S. authorities that. Or after he had made this announcement to the GATA guys uh, about him having knowledge of tapes and that the gold market was rigged, and he had told Powell and, and Bill Murphy that that, that this stuff uh, uh, that this is what he had told the regulators, and immediately thereafter, uh, 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 Mr. Armstrong was in jail on contempt, where he stayed for ten years. And two weeks later, Mr. Safra uh, was was found dead in his uh, condominium in Monaco under under extremely dubious circumstances. So, uh, and and interestingly enough, after Mr. Armstrong spent ten years in the clink, he gets out, and suddenly he has a view that the gold market isn't rigged, and uh, denies that uh, the market's rigged at all. And uh, basically makes makes uh, statements that uh, refute uh, stuff that he was well on record as saying years ago. I I actually wonder to to a point, Dunnigan, whether Mr. Armstrong actually realized why he got thrown in jail. My view is that he got thrown in jail expressly because 
he had made a public statement stating that he knew that the gold market was rigged and he, and he knew that there were tapes and he knew where he could get them. But I mean, you can go to the GATA uh, website, uh, GATA.org, and you can uh, search term Martin Armstrong uh, along with uh, uh, Edmund Safra, and you can you can you can read the articles, uh, uh, you know, with the dates on on when on when Mr. Armstrong made these uh, 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 pronouncements, and uh, you know it's well documented. And uh, Mr. Armstrong seems to have a, uh, I don't know, he seems to have a, a selective memory, I guess, as, as it relates to uh, gold price manipulation and, uh, uh, let's just say, interference by, by officialdom in the markets. And maybe it was that 10 years he spent in jail uh, that sort of uh, uh, led to his, uh, the condition he has of, uh, let's just say, selective recall. So, uh, because anybody who would be subject to such uh, uh, selective recall uh, gives me reason to not take stock so much of what they have to say today when, when their views and, and positions can change with no apparent explanation uh, or credible explanation as to why they've changed so radically. So, that's my comment regarding uh, Mr. Armstrong. And, uh, you know, I wish him well. Uh, I think he's a very troubled human being. Se separate from the personality involved or the history of, of you know, his uh, change of position or that sort of thing, uh, could you talk just a minute about, and this, I might have missed it, the... Uh, the theory of capital flows, and even if capital flows can be said, yep, well, when capital flows into things, they go up, and when it doesn't, they don't. Uh, what do you see? A, do you see that as actually uh, just a, a correlation, or as a tool of the manipulation, or as something that can turn on a dime as soon as public sentiment and awareness changes? Or what do you view the importance of capital flows versus this suppression? Let's let's just put it this way: when one well, at least, at least the, the, the way I view the, uh, the concept of capital flow, um, uh, to me, you're speaking to issues like, for instance, the velocity of money, uh, because velocity of money is, is, a, is a measure of capital flow. Uh, it's one measure. And I mean, if you go to the St. Louis Federal Reserve and look at the charts on what the velocity of money has been over the past 15 or 20 years, it is, a, it is a graph that is one way down to the right, which means the velocity of money has been getting less and less and less and less over time. And then uh, uh, that would, that would on, its, on its face, that would tend to fly in the, in the face of the amount of money that's being created uh, as in debt. And... When, so when 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 Martin Armstrong talks about about capital flows, uh, I'd, I'd like to know exactly which flows it is Mr. Armstrong's referring to. Is is he is he speaking in a big picture sense about the velocity of money, which is which is like basically gone from a very high level to like being in the ground, or or is or is he? Or is he talking about maybe the amount of uh, uh, QE that uh, Mario Draghi or Mr. Abe in Japan are, are uh, 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 because these guys these guys are buying assets, these guys are buying uh, debt uh, and and loading up central bank balance sheets like uh, uh, in, in let's just say it's never it's never be never before occurred in human history. Like the amount, the amount of asset purchases that have been conducted by the European Central Bank and by the Japanese Central the Bank of Japan, and and if and then if you want to consider the like take even a, a more sanguine central bank like the central bank in Switzerland, and I think they have uh, I think they have a, a U.S. equity book now uh, direct ownership of U.S. stocks. I believe something in the magnitude of eight hundred billion dollars worth of U.S. equities. So, uh, if 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 Mr. if Mr. Armstrong is suggesting that everything will be fine because the central banks will continue to print money, and one day central banks will own everything in the world, 
because on 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 the on the on the vector that they're currently on, it seems that might very well end up being the case, because while they talk about acting responsibly, and while they talk about uh, acting in in people's best interest, uh, their 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 actions do not really align with uh, uh, their words, and 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 just and just how. And just how these central banks, I mean, uh, how they're ever going to retreat from the positions that they've built, how the U.S. Federal Reserve is ever going to unwind its balance sheet and, and maintain any semblance of a normal market, or how just how, the, how even the Swiss central bank is going to unwind its U.S. equity position without causing a complete collapse in the U.S. equity markets. Is, is, is something that I'd like Mr. Armstrong to, to maybe try to explain. Because in the absence of new money printing uh, by another central bank, uh, I just don't know who exactly is going to buy the $800 billion worth, worth of U.S. equities that the Swiss National Bank has acquired. And, and frankly, in, in, the, in the current environment, we have a U.S. government that continues to run trillion-dollar deficits each year, and the traditional financiers of America have shown little appetite to keep the existing debt that they have, American debt that they have. So just who is going to be buying the, the additional wads of U.S. government securities that are coming to market, whether we like it or not? Uh, uh, is another question I'd like Mr. Armstrong to, to maybe respond to, because internationally, there isn't really a lot of demand for the, for the new debt. And I'm not talking about just the maturing debt that needs to be rolled and the existing debt. I'm talking about the new debt that keeps getting added to the pile on an annual basis. Uh, like, who, who has the appetite for it and who's going to keep buying it and 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 just and you see this this is something this is this is something akin to saying what goes up never comes down. So if Mr. If Mr. Martin Armstrong believes that things can go up forever, I would I would like to uh, introduce him to a law called gravity. And in and and the world I live in, things that go up usually come down, and sometimes they come down in a very spectacular fashion. And I think Mr. Armstrong might want to give a give a good thought to just how these things are going to resolve themselves, because we're 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 vectoring up, and have been vectoring up, in terms of the amount of debt outstanding, and and the amount of credit, and at some point the the, the rocket fuel burns out, and then this has to come down. So I guess he feels it's going to come down in a very orderly way. Um, I'll tell you what, I wouldn't want to be at 65,000 feet with no fuel left and no parachute. And uh, this next question is sort of springboards from there and talking about what are the powers that are at play at this? And is there any any semblance of a balance of power? Is there any, is there any other player in the game at all? Uh, the the re writer of this is Thoros and writes, do the banking families controlling pretty much everything of importance, politics, finance, industrial, military complex, food industry, pharma industry, and media in the U.S. and Europe have an opposition? Is there more than just Ron Paul and Oliver Stone? Yeah, yeah, there, there's, 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 like, there are laws of nature uh, that oppose these people. Um you know, infinitely printing money is is not uh, you know other other constituencies in the history of mankind uh, you know have have practiced uh, things like uh, history is littered with examples like we had tulip mania uh, tulip tulip mania sprung out of people not trusting uh, the currency of the day. Um, you know, we, we are seeing the emergence of the cryptocurrencies, which have grown in, uh, uh, let's just say the crypto space, Dunnigan, has grown in market capitalization from roughly $10 ish in late January, early February, to over $100 billion, 
in in market capitalization, and that's in like four or five months. So uh, I view the cryptocurrencies as an expression of uh, not wanting to hold dollars. It's a dollar alternative, or uh, the growth and explosion of cryptocurrencies, in my view, is an anti-dollar trade. And what what this shows you is that, uh, or at least what it what it points out to me is that the anti-dollar movement is is growing rapidly. I mean, it it has the anti-dollarness uh, has not been allowed to express itself in the precious metals arena yet because the precious metals prices are controlled by uh, infinite amounts of paper which are shoveled into the marketplace. But the problem with the cryptocurrencies for the powers that be are that cryptocurrencies have this unique feature. You cannot sell a cryptocurrency you do not own. There is no futures markets for cryptocurrencies. And this, and this is why cryptocurrencies have grown in, in, in terms of market capitalization, they've grown tenfold in four months. And, and maybe, maybe the growth from 10 billion to 100 billion uh, doesn't, doesn't really, really rankle the powers that be yet. But if, if in another four or five months, if, if 100 billion becomes a trillion or a trillion six, that could be a completely different uh, uh, you know, kettle of fish. And, and at some point, uh, this, this will become a very disturbing feature. People are looking for alternatives to the dollar. People are looking for alternatives to fiat money. And just because they have the precious metals paper prices uh, in straight jackets and strapped to gurneys doesn't mean that other alternatives will not rear their heads and, and, uh, and present themselves on the, uh, on the world stage. And that's exactly what we see coming. That's, in fact, what some of the questions I was about to ask you were. It says, uh, what do you think about cash being diverted to Bitcoin, et cetera, when it's not really backed by anything? Do you see a time when people will realize that it's just another Ponzi scheme? Will they revert back to real assets like gold and silver? And that, that one is kind of countered with other people who are, who are looking at it as, and we certainly have interviewed um, Andy Hoffman on here, who talks about the cryptocurrencies as an ally with gold and silver against fiat and, and government and manipulation. But if you could weigh in on what you think about the, the cash that's currently seeking Bitcoin, do you think it will revert back to precious metals? I think, I think, that, uh, I think that cryptocurrencies are here to stay. Um, I, I'm, I'm pretty much in agreeing with uh, Andy Hoffman in that I think that the cryptocurrencies ultimately uh, will be allied or allies, good allies, with the precious metals, and it may it may actually end up being applications where cryptocurrencies are are married with the physical gold market, that actually allows the precious metals to break free of their straps and uh, uh, and and start to resemble a free market. Um, it, you see, it's it's my it's my view uh, particularly that what we're seeing in the cryptocurrencies, like in the last five months, we've seen cryptocurrencies uh, go up, uh, like the biggest one, of course, being Bitcoin that everyone uh, speaks about. Um, in the last five months, that crypto, uh, Bitcoin, has gone roughly from 1,000 to 2,500. It's been as high as three. But there are smaller ones uh, uh, that have gone up in a magnitude of uh, in, like Bitcoin is up two and uh, two and a half times in five months. There there are some cryptocurrencies that are up sixty six zero times in five months. There are some that are up twenty times in five months. There are some that are up ten times in five months. Knowing which one to buy uh, uh, or exactly to hold is something that's probably beyond my pay grade. But all I'm saying is. These things have wheels, and these things can move, and these things can move extremely quickly. And if precious metals prices weren't so heavily suppressed, 
This is exactly the sort of thing I could see silver doing once it's freed from its shackles, and gold too to a lesser extent. But with the gold-silver ratio being at the lofty levels that it is, at roughly 75 to 1 currently, uh, I, I, would, I would think that uh, if we revert to a, an unsuppressed market, which I think comes at some point, I think that the performance of silver could be much, much more explosive than the performance of gold in, in, a, in a free market setting. And the reason for that, uh, when I speak of the gold-silver ratio, just for a refresher uh, for, for the listeners, the, the, the gold-silver ratio is an expression of how many ounces of silver uh, at, say, $16 it would take to buy an ounce of gold, and that number is roughly 75 ounces. 75 times 16 gives you round about the price of an ounce of gold. Um, when, when gold and silver are mined from the Earth's crust, uh, the amount of silver that's mined for every ounce of gold that is mined, it's, it, it comes out of the Earth's crust at a ratio of about 8 to 1. So that means for every ounce of gold that's mined, 8 ounces of silver get mined. And that, to me, would tend to imply that nature would, would, would dictate or insinuate that uh, the price of silver should be probably something around one eighth to one tenth of the price of an ounce of gold. And if silver were to be uh, one tenth of the price of gold, silver would today be at $120. Well, silver is not at $120. Silver is suppressed and it's trading at 16 in the paper markets. So my view is that if the suppression is to end, the price of silver could move up very, very quickly to something approaching what, in my view, nature dictates. And silver has, a, has just as long a history as being a monetary metal as gold. Uh, and the other, the other interesting aspect, gold regard, uh, versus silver, is that virtually every ounce of gold ever mined is in existence in, in stocks. On the, on the face of the earth. And silver being a dual use metal, being monetary and industrial, silver tends to get consumed. And the reality is there is much less in terms of stock of silver available above ground than there is uh, gold by a factor of about eight. I think there's roughly, a, there's, there's widely admitted to be roughly around a billion ounces of silver uh, in existence in above ground stocks, which which is about the amount of silver that's mined out of the Earth's crust in one year, whereas there's probably uh, I think seven or eight billion ounces of of gold in identifiable uh, or alleged uh, above ground stocks. So silver in reality is more rare above ground, uh, you know, on the planet than gold. And uh, why it's trading at 175th the price of an ounce of gold is something that Mr. maybe Mr. Mnuchin and the uh, folks at the Exchange Stabilization Fund would like to explain in detail. Well, we, with respect to your time, Rob, I think we're really, really reaching the end of our list of questions that we can uh, ask. But we give you one more chance if you have anything from your current research that you want to make sure you leave a thought or uh, with our viewing audience, uh, sure appreciate that. Um, you know, I, I, I would say my closing my closing commentary is that the ride that we've all experienced for people who are long precious metal and long physical precious metal, as I am always an advocate of, it's been a brutal ride. We have been subject to uh, relentless uh, criminal fraudulent interventions, uh, uh, suppressive interventions. And 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 what I what I refer to is uh, literally financial buggery on the on the part of the U.S. Treasury and and its supporting actors. And I think this I think this message needs to be needs to be uh, broadcast uh, in a very forcible way publicly. It needs to be discussed. And people who deny the existence of of a, a, a 
uh, intervention in our in our capital markets to suppress prices and to rig prices. Uh, these people uh, who, who, who refuse to admit that this goes on, they need to be admonished and they need to be jeered and they, and they need to be ignored because this is going on in spades. And you know what? This, this charade is getting awfully long in the tooth and uh, people might want to think about uh, uh, global, global peace and global security in terms of if we don't get if we don't start getting this right uh you know we we're all in big big trouble well rob you always give us a lot to think about and uh it's sobering and it uh, is bracing and it is reconfirming for people who need their basically do a sanity check because when they trust their gut and they look around and they say this can't be right this can't be what's really going on and you, from your perspective, your vantage point and your depth of research and experience can corroborate a lot of people's gut feeling that things are quite uh, off and not as they should be. So we just uh, are deeply grateful for your advocacy and your, uh, your words of wisdom that you share with us here and for all of our viewers on Reluctant Preppers. I thank you. Uh, pleasure being with you, uh, Dunnick.